Good morning once again. Uh, good morning once uh, again. Guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, guests, Jumbo. ladies and gentlemen, Ham Jumbo. Yeah, Ham Jumbo. Yeah, Ham Jumbo. Thank you. Uh, thank you. For those of uh, you who are not for from those Kenya, of you who are not from Kenya, Kenya make sure to say a few words in Swahili before you go back home. And if you don't, then I advise and you to go and watch the Lion King. At least you can know how to say Hakuna Matata. It's one of the most common words. It's one of the most every common words. Every time I mention, uh, every time yeah, I mention I've seen that, that somewhere. Yeah, I've, I've seen that somewhere. Yeah, so today uh, marks yeah, the so second today, and last day, uh, marks of, the second our and last day of our conference. Uh, you will notice we've reduced uh, the size of the room we've reduced the size of the room because the day is also, day short, and is also short and uh, we don't expect, expect uh, we don't expect the presenters uh, of yesterday to the be coming in of yesterday to be coming in today in part because they also have engagements and i suggest that uh, and i suggest one that uh, there can only be one again, person talking in the room once again because i can see people you may talking. be sanctioned uh, you may be sanctioned are not pretty uh, sanctions are not pretty and today is a important and day. Today is a important we day to part because we are going to look at some scenarios, of the possible scenarios, as well as, uh, recommendations, for as, well as uh, recommendations for policy and action. And, and we're going to be guided. And by we're going to be guided by um, um, very able moderators. Very able moderators. Led and we'll be starting led with, and uh, we'll starting with uh, Professor. Fred Fred to lead us in the first session. To lead us in the first Professor session. Professor Junior is currently chair of the Department of Science and Public Administration, Public Administration, Public Administration, Public Administration, Public Administration, Public Administration University of Nairobi. Administration, University of Nairobi. I ask that uh, this being I the final day, that, uh, this being the final during day, the Q and A, during the Q and A, once again, again, once uh, again, please let's be uh, very please precise, let's be in our questions. very precise in our questions. We can keep them within. We can keep them within thirty seconds and thirty seconds. Our responses to keep it within our responses like two minutes, minutes is going to be very helpful. Two minutes is going to be very helpful. He's going to say his own ground rules. going to say his own ground rules. I just wanted to mention that. So I just wanted to mention that so we can be able to manage time and ensure that we break on time. And ensure that we allow sufficient engagement from the floor and participation from the floor because sometimes from the floor because sometimes. Time. Check your time. If we don't we check your time, then we uh, lose out on uh, some of the quality. Lose out on some of the quality. Of that, uh, so we're studying about, so about, about ten minutes. So we're studying about ten minutes a little uh, bit late, past the hour. Uh, past but the I hour. believe we're going to but do well. But I believe we're going to and do so well. Please join me in welcoming. And so our please join me in welcoming our next uh, moderator, uh, Professor Fred uh, Jonya. Uh, Professor. Professor Fred Jonya. Professor. Uh, director of the Horn Institute, director of the Horn Institute, Dr. Hassan Kanyen, distinguished, uh, distinguished uh, participants. Good morning. Participants, good morning. I've been officially given legitimate I've been officially power. given legitimate so power. So I will exercise it. So I will exercise it legitimately. Uh, we are having. Uh, uh, we are having uh, four, sorry, three presenters. Four, sorry, and, uh, three presenters. Uh, make their presentations uh, for fifteen make their minutes. Presentations for 15 then, uh, minutes. You ca if you have some then, uh, questions, you, ca if you have down, some questions, you can end of it. Down, then at you the can tail end of it, you can now shoot your questions to any of the presenters. At the Q and A, as the Q and A. As we, you, as we don't mention, uh, we, we don't require uh, another presentation. Require another presentation. So you just, uh, so shoot, you just your questions. Uh, we shoot your questions. Precise. We should be bullet precise. So allow me to introduce. So the first allow me to introduce the first presenter uh, who's coming to present uh, on the role, to present on of, the role civil society of civil society and other key groups and other in key groups Sudan mediation. In Sudan the presenter mediation. is Ayan the presenter Rie. is Ayan Ayan Rie. is uh, hands Ayan on. Is, uh, hands right. on. Uh, with over right. ten years, uh, to with over ten years to on peace belt. building on peace building. Initiatives. So who else would be the best? So who else would be the best for this particular scenario? For this so I particular am, scenario. Uh, so welcome to uh, welcome to the floor and the make floor your presentation and uh, make I'll your guide you once three I'll minutes, guide you three once three so minutes that you can remain, wrap up your so that you can welcome, wrap up your Ayan. presentation. Welcome, Ayan. Thank you very much. Thank um, you very Asante much. Sana. Um, Asante sana. Um, excellencies, uh, um, ladies excellencies, and gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. All protocols um, observed. Um, I think I will. I think I will. 
before uh, speaking I speak on the role of civil society, uh, I, want to of civil society minute, I want to just uh, for a few seconds reflect on yesterday's discussion, which will in a way inform today's session. Uh, session um, talking about um, um, talking about the regional and global um, efforts, the regional and global um, efforts that um, we see in the uh, that we see in the region the, and uh, in the region uh, and intervening uh, in, in Sudan intervening uh, in, in Sudan the need, um, uh, the need to have uh, uh, coordinated, to have, uh, uh, coordinated uh, efforts uh, and most importantly uh, and most importantly the history the reflections on the history of Sudan and I felt today. that uh, and I felt the history that, of Sudan uh, understanding uh, the history of Sudan from, uh, Actually, the current interventions, the current interventions, and future interventions as well. It's also important to note that uh, main, most of the discussions yesterday were more or less focused on the political process, uh, which is uh, track one uh, in mediation. We refer to it as track one, where we have the three, three um, tracks. Uh, but it's also imperative to discuss. Um, the need for meaningful inclusion of all relevant stakeholders uh, in order to have lasting solutions and sustainable peace. Um, before I start uh, speaking on what is going on in Sudan and uh, what the civil society organization and other key groups have been doing, um, I will want to point out that um, as we speak uh, today um, and in the last six months, uh, the agenda has been one uh, to bring peace to Sudan, to stabilize the situation. Then I think uh, when it comes to addressing other issues, uh, we will leave it to the Sudanese to identify the issues and come up with uh, possible solutions. And uh, the regional mechanisms, the African Union, uh, the international partners, um, their role and responsibility is just to facilitate those discussions. Uh, that's how I see it. Um, so oftentimes in mediation, um, there is the question of inclusion. Uh, the question of inclusion arises, but also the question of exclusion. Who do you need to include and who should be included, excluded from the process? And I think that has something to do with uh, the role of these actors. Um, moving on to today's session on the role of civil society and other key groups in Sudan and in mediation, uh, we see um, I have worked in the IGAD region for the last 10 years and have had the opportunity to work closely, not just with governments uh, at the national, subnational level, but also with civil society actors, uh, various stakeholders, women groups, uh, youth groups. And uh, we note that uh, the civil society organizations for the longest time have had this uh, sort of in-out adversarial relationship with governments and, and other actors. Uh, for various reasons, but we have also seen uh, progress uh, made over time. Um, the relationship has been has changed, and the engagement, um, even though we see engagement of civil society in different aspects and spheres, still it remains random uh, and often included in, in the last stage. Um, civil society, what we see in Sudan, um, is that they are more or less included uh, at the community level and their role remains at the community level and there's nothing wrong with that. I see it as an opportunity uh, because civil society actually do have a critical role uh, in preventing conflicts and managing uh, these conflicts uh, at the subnational levels. Um, so in Sudan, uh, we see that the civil society organization and other key groups have been involved both directly and indirectly uh, in the political process. Um, we have for the last four months seen civil society organization uh, being uh, the critical frontline responders, living and working through that crisis. Um, civil society organizations and most of the national civil society organizations working on the ground have been and are uh, providing the much needed uh, humanitarian assistance. Uh, we've had uh, a few remarks yesterday also uh, on the role of civil society. Uh, they have been providing humanitarian assistance. They have been advocating on, be on behalf of the victims of human rights violations. There are various reports that came out of Sudan uh, that are speaking on victims uh, on human rights issues. 
uh, but then civil society actually the ones you know responding to that and advocating uh, on behalf of the victims um, they are responding to the needs of displaced people um, internally in Sudan and those affected by the conflicts across all states uh, in Sudan even in places, and um, I know many of you are informed, even in places where the international humanitarian organizations could not access, we saw civil society and civilian actors at large uh, providing the much needed support. Um, additionally, the civil society organizations are involved uh, in community empowerment. As we speak today, they are organizing themselves to start uh, stakeholder public consultations. Uh, before the April uh, conflict and, and in between, we have seen civil society organizations trying to facilitate dialogue uh, between uh, the stakeholders. Um, what we also see coming from Sudan in terms of the role of civil society organization is that they have been actively calling upon the generals to peacefully resolve uh, their differences or address their differences. Uh, they are calling on regional mechanisms. We've had uh, the opportunity to meet with different actors and they're calling on the African Union, they're calling on the UN, they're calling on, uh, on EGAD and other international partners to increase uh, their coordination. Uh, to increase their intervention and to coordinate those interventions. And we have seen that many of them are encouraging uh, an African, we've, we've had this discussion also yesterday, they're encouraging an African-led mediation process, um, uh, which in includes or involves uh, actors who understand the context uh, of the conflict. Um, Having said that, it's imperative to uh, prioritize the civil society organizations um, because they have lived and experienced such situations before. They have lived in these conflicts uh, during and after. And when a formal process begins, we see that civil society organizations always uh, uh, mostly uh, brought into the peace process after the conflicting parties have uh, reached a settlement. Uh, they are brought on board uh, to monitor uh, the progress uh, and the implementation of the peace agreement, to implement certain provisions within the settlement um, reached by dispute parties, but I think um, their role could be more um, an active role uh, rather than you know, a passive role of uh, monitoring um, the agreements, uh, or at the community level uh, to that end. Um, what we see also in Sudan is uh, national and uh, local civil society organizations um, have actually, um, they have the people's trust as compared to the political leaders. The political leaders have lost, as we speak, the trust of the people uh, and the civil society organizations uh, could uh, step in in that position to uh, work with the local communities, work with the communities, with the population, uh, with Sudanese, uh, to provide a transfer mechanism. Uh, and I think uh, from where I stand, uh, mediators could engage and uh, meaningfully engage civil society actors um, uh, in, 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 in a process, if a formal process begins, uh, to act as a transfer mechanism between uh, the population, the people of Sudan, and whatever that process is going to look like uh, at the political level. Um, the South Sudan, sorry, Sudan, <laughs> I'm based in South Sudan, so I keep referring. Uh, the Sudanese civil society actors, uh, we, see doing, um, we see them doing public consultation, trying to consolidate uh, the views, the concerns, the interest, and the position of the people of Sudan, um, understanding what it is that they need um, in order uh, for them to transfer that, those needs and concerns into um, uh, the political space. Um, additionally, um, what we see is that um, before the agreement was signed in April, before the, the crisis in Sudan, um, civil society organizations um, were to an extent, or civil actors were to an extent uh, involved uh, in that political process in Khartoum, 
but there came a time where they had to uh, split and divide because they felt like there was no meaningful representation. Um, going forward, if we are going to have, uh, or if there will be a need to involve civil, uh, civil society actors and other groups, and I'll come to the other groups later, and other groups in the political peace process, uh, it's important uh, that, um, that mediators at that uh, point avoid tokenism, uh, where they will have just any civil society actors uh, who are not uh, representative of a certain base or certain group in the process. Um, that is going to be redundant. Um, I will move on to the role of civil society and other groups in mediation, but before I do that, um, the other actors that we've seen um, in Sudan uh, to an extent w that we will see as civil uh, society, uh, the other revolutionary civil society movements and groups. We have the, free, uh, the forces of freedom and change, a, com a coalition comprising of Sudanese professional associations, uh, Mansam, uh, No Oppression Against uh, Women Initiative, the Sudanese Revolutionary Front, and the Sudanese Resistance Committees, who have been involved uh, directly and indirectly in the political process pushing for a civilian-led uh, government. Um, as of April, we see the resistance committees uh, that have reorganized themselves, and they are actually the emergency centers and emergency response um, teams that are providing vital services in Sudan, such as medical and uh, evacuation um, services. Um, having said that, we. Uh, the, I have had also the opportunity between April and July to uh, speak with and talk to civil society organizations, women groups, youth groups, to understand the challenges uh, that they are facing, and many of them, ooh, all right, <laughs> and many of them have pointed on to uh, pointed out logistical issues. Uh, uh, movement working from outside of Khartoum, many of them have left. Uh, I think as of June, they, they tried to stay in Khartoum, tried to stay in Sudan to support, but they had to leave, and they're finding it difficult to work from outside of, uh, of Sudan. They're also worried for and concerned for the well-being and safety and security of, for themselves and also for their families. Uh, issues of limited resources uh, and funds uh, for response and protection. Um, I've been involved in certain groups where we tried to mobilize resources to send to Khartoum, but at that point, uh, the banking systems were not working and there was no way to transfer those funds, uh, but the initiatives are still ongoing. Uh, fragmentation has been also a key challenge uh, that we have seen. The freedom, uh, forces of freedom for change, uh, forces of freedom and change uh, split. Uh, civil society organizations now have different positions. There's no common objective. Uh, there's no common position among uh, civil society and uh, other key uh, groups. Um, but then if there is going to be a, an, an organization, an entity, a mechanism, whether it's African Union, UN, IGAD, uh, that uh, will lead and facilitate a mediation process, uh, should the generals agree to sit and, and, and dialogue, then there is need to have a framework mechanism that is going to uh, look into ways of meaningfully engaging uh, civil actors, women groups, youth groups, and other key uh, groups in Sudan. Um, the way I see it, and I have worked in mediation, and I, uh, have, I think I've done some courses in mediation and a master's in mediation, but working with mediators, what we see is that um, for you to have an effective, and, and that is the topic of discussion, an effective mediation, then you have to design a process. And to design a process, you require, um, first of all, to identify the actors, uh, who the actors, the primary actors, the ones who are fighting, so that you can bring them to the table and, and stop the fighting, but also the public at large and what their concerns and needs are. You have to understand the context within which this conflict is taking place. Uh, you have to also identify the issues. Um, what are the issues that the mediator wants to mediate and what are the issues that the conflicting parties want to talk about 
Uh, and lastly, what are the processes that have been going on and how do we link this process? And I think most of the discussions yesterday were centered on this or revolved around uh, what are the processes that exist. We've seen the quartet, uh, the quad, uh, uh, the troika, so on and so forth. But there was also the question of what are the issues, what are the mediators going to mediate? But I think um, what is more important is what are the parties and the people of Sudan willing to discuss? What do they want to talk about? And how do we bring that into our process? And I think uh, that is that from me. Thank you very much. Can we give us some uh, strong clappy hands? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ayan Nuriye. Ayan uh, has given us a very good presentation on the role of civil society and other key groups in Sudan mediation. She comes from uh, the IGAD mediation support. Allow me also to recognize uh, the director of uh, Conrad, Nils, who is also a partner in this uh, workshop. Now, the next presenter is Dr. Walter Ochanda. Oh, Dr. Ochanda is coming to present on the responses and uh, strategies by the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, IGAD, and he is also a special envoy uh, for the Red Sea, Gulf of Aden, and Somalia. So he lives on land, but he oversees the sea. <laughs> so you can see how complicated it is. So, Doc, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Your Excellencies, Ambassadors present, uh, distinguished uh, panelists, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Let me make one uh, modification to the last remark of the moderator. I am not the special envoy, but I advise uh, the special envoy. Uh, I work with him uh, on the Red Sea Gulf of Aden and, and Somalia. So I think uh, my talk uh, or the theme that I've been given uh, to look at the responses and strategies um, that the intergovernmental uh, authority on development has uh, embarked on. Uh, before uh, talking about the strategies, I thought it would be good to highlight um, some of the facts that were uh, adduced yesterday. Of course, it is a fact that millions of people have been displaced internally uh, and, and also across uh, the borders. Yesterday, we were informed that um, over 4 million, I mean, over 4,000 people have been killed, and uh, around 20 million uh, Sudanese are actually are facing high level of acute hunger, and that the conflict is also spreading to other uh, regions of the country. Uh, for example, there is now the spillover in Nyala, in southern Darfur, uh, Al Fasher, uh, also North Darfur, and of course Kordofan, and that the armed movements are also joining conflicts on either side um, of the conflict parties. And uh, similar instances or movements are also happening in Darfur and Kordofan. Uh, we were also informed uh, that there is a proliferation of initiatives. So against this background, um, what has been IGAD's uh, sort of uh, responses? Uh, in my view, IGAD aspires for uh, a Sudanese-owned and Sudanese-led uh, process, peace process, which is, of course, facilitated by the region in collaboration with African Union and other stakeholders. And uh, IGAD views um, all these other initiatives as complementary to the process. And, of course, that uh, there is now increasing movements towards harmonization of all uh, this initiative so that the process is one and, and it moves forward. Now, in terms of the responses that uh, IGAD has undertaken, uh, I would like to start at the highest level, at the highest policy organ level. There has been a head of state and government uh, summit decision, of course, which established the, uh, the high level delegation that then transitioned into what is now called the quartet. So that decision has happened at the highest uh, level of the IGAD policy uh, organ structure. Uh, below that, there has been also activation of um, 
the IGAD Quartet uh, Council of Ministers, uh, who met, of course, to, to fast track the implementation of uh, the roadmap that was approved by also the highest policy organ. And then uh, IGAD also in the interim, while uh, there is search for uh, a special envoy, a substantive special envoy for Sudan, IGAD has deployed uh, Ambassador uh, Ismail Weiss. Many of you know him. He has been the, I mean, he's a special envoy for South Sudan, IGAD special envoy for South Sudan. And he, he adequately mediated the South Sudan peace agreement. He is now supporting uh, IGAD efforts in terms of IGAD's representation in the uh, the expanded mechanism, but also following up uh, on the Sudan peace process. So Ambassador Wise is in, in the interim. He is uh, being delegated by the Executive Secretary to follow up on uh, the Sudan-related issues, including engaging with other uh, entities, IGAD, I mean, uh, AU, UN, and also uh, the, the Arab League. Uh, at the, more or less at the Peace and Security uh, Division level, we have a mechanism called C1, which is the Conflict Early Warning and Response Mechanism. Uh, this body uh, produces a regular analysis and reports to inform uh, the IGAD uh, leadership, and it, they have been producing flash reports. In fact, even prior to the conflict breaking, they, they, they have been producing these early warning reports and, of course, uh, sharing it with uh, the stakeholders. So that uh, body is in place and it's providing flash reports, updates on what is happening on the ground. Uh, in fact, the recent report indicates the fighting that is happening in Khartoum around the, the command center. Uh, so th these regular reports, as part of the response to inform the, the political process, is being done uh, by uh, the conflict early warning and response mechanism. IGAD has also established uh, a humanitarian coordination uh, focal uh, office. It is in Port Sudan, and this, of course, was spearheaded by our Executive Secretary, His, Ex His Excellency uh, Dr. Wakana. Uh, so the Humanitarian Coordination Unit at Port Sudan is coordinating with other uh, entities um, who are undertaking humanitarian response at that level. Uh, of course, there has been also back-channel and shuttle diplomacy uh, by other members of the, the quartet. Uh, including, of course, um, the President of South Sudan, uh, to engage uh, with the principals. So the issue of access that was raised um, yesterday, uh, in fact, IGAD has that access to uh, the, the principals. And then, uh, of course, uh, on the issue of appointing the special envoy, as I said, uh, that search is still there. And on the issue of capacity to mediate, I believe, uh, for many of you who have worked in the region, there is presidents. IGAD, as was mentioned yesterday, uh, midwife the CPA, but IGAD also mediated the agreement in South Sudan. In fact, I was part of uh, that process as well. And for those who have been following other dynamics in other member states, including the Ethiopia peace process, I think you'll agree with me, the Pretoria process uh, IGAD played a very fundamental role to reaching what is now called the Secession of Hostilities Agreement in Northern Ethiopia. So without IGAD and working very collectively with the AU, uh, it would have been very difficult. So there is already a presidency in terms of collaboration with AU, but also with the UN and other uh, mechanisms. So uh, briefly, uh, there are other responses that IGAD has undertaken, but that's what I wanted to highlight. Uh, in terms of the strategies now uh, that are deployed, of course, one, one of them is this quartet uh, mechanism that is, of course, the overarching uh, entity that is now spearheading IGAD's effort in, in the Sudanese uh, peace process. But also, um, the, both the IGAD and the AU, uh, if you will recollect, I think on 27th of May uh, this year, uh, the AU, a Peace and Security Council, uh, of course held uh, a meeting and uh, they approved um, or endorsed the AU roadmap uh, for peace in Sudan. Of course, that roadmap broadly looks at the issue of 
uh, collectivity in, in actions uh, in terms of uh, uh, dealing uh, with the, the, the current crisis in, in, in Sudan. The next month, which was in June, uh, on June 12, of course, the IGAD heads of state uh, and government equally um, also approved IGAD roadmap for peace in Sudan. Now, these two roadmaps, uh, of course, they confirm one thing or reaffirm one thing that uh, there is need for a common uh, position on the issue of Sudan, but also that there, there is no military solution uh, to the conflict, and uh, it accords priority to a fully representative and inclusive uh, Sudanese-owned and Sudanese-led uh, political uh, dialogue process. And uh, IGAD, of course, uh, continues to work very closely uh, with the AU and other stakeholders on the implementation of the, road, of the two map, uh, roadmaps. And uh, is also, IGAD is also working very closely with the AU uh, and engaging with other stakeholders, uh, notably uh, the League of Arab States, uh, via a forum which have been, uh, I mean, has been uh, branded as Expanded Mechanism on Sudan and the core group. And IGAD is, of course, a part of the Secretariat of that Expanded uh, Mechanism. But the key uh, issue here is that in this engagement of IGAD, uh, the special envoy who is currently uh, representing the Secretariat will inform, will consult, and deliberate uh, with other uh, mechanisms during uh, the, the engagements of this expanded mechanism. Also, uh, in terms of a strategy, there is a, a joint, actually, AU and uh, IGAD operational framework uh, that has been developed. And it is aimed at convening uh, the, the, the political uh, dialogue of non belligerents uh, on the basis of uh, the two roadmaps which I aforementioned. But the objective is to, to initiate a parallel process uh, bringing together these non uh, belligerents sometimes described as uh, civil society uh, groups on the, on the basis of, of course, a Sudanese-owned and uh, Sudanese-led uh, led process. Uh, I think this uh, political dialogue will unfold in two uh, phases. The first phase, of course, will be a, prepare, a preparatory phase that will deliberate on the program of work uh, for the civilian uh, political dialogue, agree on participation uh, going forward. Uh, that will, of course, ensure the issues of inclusivity and develop, of course, the calendar of meetings that have to take place. And the hope is that uh, this initiative will then culminate into uh, an inclusive framework uh, that will outline principles of broader um, civilian uh, dialogue and also a common understanding of the parameters uh, of, uh, for inclusivity. But as I conclude, uh, so there is the willingness and uh, the, what I would call the political will from our leadership in terms of uh, responding on this issue of Sudan, and it has been expressed at the highest level, at the heads of state and government level, through the establishment of a quartet, but also uh, a directive for the council also to be activated to follow up on this issue and draw the implementation timelines and so on, but also deploying uh, an interim uh, official to be following up on this process. So that commitment is there, and I believe that um, the discussions or the recommendations arising from this dialogue uh, will be, of course, shared uh, to inform um, and also shape uh, the interventions uh, that uh, IGAD is undertaking uh, in Sudan, of course, collectively with the African Union and other stakeholders. So um, in, in a nutshell, uh, IGAD recognizes um, that sustainable peace uh, or peaceful solution can only be achieved through a transparent process and uh, honest uh, collaboration with, uh, of course, national, regional, and international actors and stakeholders. I thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Doc. I think uh, uh, Dr. Chanda has given us a very a comprehensive analysis. IGAD plays a very important role, and it's the one that also anchors the Eastern Africa standby force, which I think you are familiar with. So thank you very much, Doc, for your wonderful presentation. Now the final presenter for this session will be Ms. Joannina Karugaba, who is a senior interagency coordination officer 
at the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, a topic would be responses and strategies by the United Nations. So welcome, Madam. Let us give her some warm appreciation. Thank you very much. And um, let me start by thanking the previous speakers, Ian and Walter. Um, for their interventions, but also the speakers from yesterday for their very insightful uh, analysis and contributions to the discussion. Um, I, when I accepted to step into, and I will say I didn't accept to step into his shoes because Ambassador Afi should have been here, our special envoy, um, but he wasn't available. But I accepted to represent UNHCR, um, and I gave a caveat that I would speak about the humanitarian interventions and focus on UNHCR, so not the entirety of the UN. As you know, the UN is very big. Um, could I please ask for my slide presentation to be put up in the meantime? Um, okay, so I'll speak about the Sudan situation and uh, the way that we are approaching it as uh, UNHCR um, and talk about it as a situation because it has spread beyond borders like we've all analyzed. Um, could I have the next slide, please? I will also assert that uh, the humanitarian refugee response is a critical part of the movement from crisis um, to resolution. And that if refugees are not part of that movement, then I think we will not have something that is uh, sustainable. So in terms of the, the UN presence or UN activities, I would best present it as saying in the Sudan situation, we have, um, we have the refugee, refugee dimension, we have the cluster system, and we have the development system. Obviously, they have overlaps, the necessary and complementary overlaps, but also those unintended um, redundancies that exist and create uh, a heavy bureaucracy. Nonetheless, um, UNHCR covers the refugee coordination model, both in country and out of country. And I think yesterday somebody mentioned that we do, originally Sudan did host 800,000 refugees. So what has happened to those refugees in the meantime? Um, now that the conflict has ensued. Then there's a cluster system which re, uh, looks at IDPs and is under the humanitarian coordinator and has a uh, humanitarian response plan which was updated in response to the conflict. And I'll talk about that a little bit. And then there's the development system. Um, so now let me uh, go to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of the, the refugee model, we've implemented uh, what we have based, the tools and mechanisms that respond to conflict situations, such as the Sudan situation. We've got a refugee coordination model, which was really trying to promote some kind of a predictable response, something which is transparent, effective, and inclusive, and also builds upon our global compact for refugees, which was affirmed in 2018, where we were talking about really supporting the, the responsibility sharing of asylum governments um, to take on the, the, the responsibility of refugees on a long term. Next slide, please. So um, for the situation, uh, Sudan situation, we did employ the tools that we have put in place. One of them is to have, under the refugee coordination model, is to initiate a plan for the refugee response. So where were people flowing to it, to become refugees? They were flowing to the neighboring countries. And yesterday we highlighted those countries and how they may be involved or impacted. So what we came uh, to do was to set up a Sudan refugee response. It covers five countries, but also there are two others now that are implicated, which are Eritrea and Libya, because people are moving. Um, uh, moving across borders, and these uh, movements are not, uh, are not necessarily planned. So for the rest, the refugee uh, response plans are a tool um, to create some visibility, to raise resources, to bring multiple stakeholders on board. Can I please have the next slide? And it runs until December. But I will give a caveat that when we initially launched the refugee response plan, we thought it wouldn't take that long. Actually, the, the Sudan operation said returnees will three months, and I think things should subside. 
we've had to re revise the response plan twice so far, meaning that whatever analysis we were using and scenarios we were using didn't tell us the scale and the magnitude of the, of the situation. So a refugee response plan is supposed to have multiple actors, and I just listed some of those multiple actors. But in practice, what we find is that we have fewer actors. One, it's an emergency. Two, maybe the UN coordination structures are not best appropriate or um, appealing for whatever reason, we have a, a slightly uh, reduced number um, than what you would see up there. Next slide, please. Um, so for the regional response to the Sudan situation, we have 64 partners. We'll say slightly more because when we did the calculation of 64 partners, what we did was if you are the UNHCR will not count you in the five countries that you are, will count you once. But in reality, UNHCR in South Sudan is a different infrastructure and cost to UNHCR in Central African Republic, for example. So yes, the magnitude is 64 plus partners that are part of our refugee response plan and are appealing for funds. Um, we, 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 you can see the amounts of money that are there. You can see the number of returns. I think that was something highlighted yesterday, but just to emphasize that people, due to the Sudan conflict, were forced to return. They were refugees or they were migrants, but they were forced to return in adverse. We would normally say people should return in safety and in dignity, and it should be voluntary. I don't think you can see people return from Sudan in a voluntary fashion, but that's the magnitude that we have large scale numbers of people returning, especially to South Sudan a situation which is already not conducive for sustainable return. So you have to think of the implications. What happens to people who return in adverse uh, circumstances? They put pressure on their countries of origin. Anyway, those numbers speak to both refugee returnees and migrant returnees. Um, we also had third country nationals. I think they didn't really feature much, but those come and maybe the, the, the support to them is, is not as prolonged as others. We're looking at a financial request. When you say what are the interventions you're doing, the needs at a financial request by end of the year in, in one to close to a billion uh, shillings. Um, so that's in terms of the response, that's what it is, and those are the countries it covers. We did do a contingency plan for Libya and Eritrea in the um, aspiration that we're not actually going to activate operational activities there because of the difficulty of those two, two locations. But we know that people have started returning and the numbers may grow as we, we, we go along. Um, so this is the last revision up to December. Are we close to those numbers? Will we get to those numbers by December? Because these are planned numbers by December. Let's go to the next slide, please. So these are the current numbers. They were flashed yesterday. I won't go into them, but by the scenarios and the discussions which were painted yesterday, I would say very likely we are heading towards those numbers which we predicted by December. And into 2024, the numbers may continue to increase, meaning Sudanese uh, refugees, uh, Sudanese uh, populations will continue to move in adverse conditions. So those are the numbers. I, I made reference to the 800,000 uh, refugees who were hosted in Sudan before the conflict and at least 187,000 who are known to have moved. A lot of them moved out of Khartoum, some to the existing camps where they could find some safety within Sudan, but others uh, have ended up crossing, and we call them returnees because they've returned to Sudan, to South Sudan or to Chad. Um, so yes, we have internal movements as well, and we have those refugees there. Um, next slide, please. Um, in terms of the interventions, what are the sectors? I've listed down the standard sectors. Many of you may be involved or not involved, but you would be aware about the needs that refugees had. I remember yesterday um, um, MSF presenting about the critical needs. In fact, she, she made one comparison about uh, 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 trauma surgery and comparing it to the serious situation. And for me, that then rang a bell about how critical it was. But she also talked about the, the, the outbreaks, the disease outbreaks. But any population moving into a new area across a border, I think somebody also talked about rank, which is 
underserved, remote, far from uh, 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 services, um, the basic services that any population would need. And because of absence of services, then you have a lot of other risks which are emanating from that, including child protection risks, gender-based violence risks, but also diseases. So those are the list of interventions which are in a regional response plan, which we are initiating in the neighboring countries and which are running. Uh, next slide. So um, while we have those sectors and we would give you sphere standards and say every refugee in an emergency context should have so many liters of water per day per person, the reality is it's not happening. It is not happening. It is not happening because we don't have the resources. The interagency community, which is responding in the neighboring countries, does not have those resources. So there's a lot of pressure in receiving countries, and I think countries continue to advocate for the resources. I, I presented um, what is uh, on our refugee funding tracker. We are obliged to be transparent, but that transparency is, like I said, the re regional refugee response is an interagency response. We have multiple partners who, who are appealing for funding, receiving funding, and working in these locations. So they are obliged to report. So I'll give that, uh, I'll say we are underfunded. It is a fact. But I'll give a caveat that sometimes some agencies aren't reporting, uh, reporting in real time. But it is factual. We are underfunded. You go to these locations, and your heart breaks to see the conditions in which people are returning, but also in the conditions of asylum. Yesterday, somebody asked a question about Egypt. Are visas required for refugees? They shouldn't be. But the fact is, they are. And it's limiting the outflow. People who would have fled are being held back for days and days trying to apply for visas. In normal circumstances, in this region, in the IGAD region, people don't apply for visas. When you're fleeing, you have a right to asylum. And that is one of the activities that we continue to do along with uh, um, other actors in terms of advocating. So those are the gaps, critical, critical gaps, um, which do not allow us to, to do the interventions that we hope. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So we have a regional refugee response responding to those who have fled. Majority are South Sudanese refugees. But we also have that internal displacement. As a matter of fact, um, I recall that um, IOM was recently presenting its um, IDP population. And they said, yes, there are 300, uh, uh, they, they were 3 million who have been displaced according to this conflict. But there were another 4 million who were displaced before. So there are 7 million people displaced. Anyway, uh, uh, OCHA did uh, update, revise the humanitarian response plan, and those are the details. But again, you can see the gap. So people are not being assisted inside, and even when they get out of the country, they are not being adequately assisted. So that's a call to really donors to, to step up. Next slide, this slide, please. Um, so I will come to a few questions that I put down. Will the conflict and displacement be protracted? From the discussion yesterday, I will leave you to make your, 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 your conclusions that, on that. And during the UNGA, there was a, 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 a forum where they discussed what is the cost of inaction in Sudan. That I leave again for, for you to think about. Um, what is the impact on a poorly resourced humanitarian program? We are talking about humanitarian, meaning life-saving. What is the impact? of a poorly resourced humanitarian program, not only in the neighboring countries, which have opened generously their borders, but actually also in Sudan, that people are there, they've not, or they fled maybe internally, but it's still poorly resourced. And then I'll break it down and say, let's look at the specific people we are actually talking about. They have faces, they have names, they have ages. What is the impact on children out of school for years? Are we going to end up feeding into a more protracted, more critical situation where you have people who are then easily recruited into fighting just because they are displaced, unable to access resources, and maybe the only mega resources that are available are coming from or with the wrong motive like 
child recruitment. Those are the things I want us to think about in terms of what is the regional impact and what are the interventions the UN, but also NGOs uh, can help mitigate. I'll end with a call which I took and rephrased from my High Commissioner, um, uh, which is a call to bring together multiple efforts of the multiple actors um, so, sorry, I can't even see it from here. So that peace can prevail and humanitarian assistance can be intensified. Otherwise, one solution or one group of actors is not going to resolve it. It has to involve multiple countries. It has to look at how will refugees be part of the solution? Where will they fit in the long term? Um, and I will end that uh, on, the, on the note of saying that in 2023, we are going to have a global refugee forum where different actors are making pledges, pledges for situations of displacement, including the situation of uh, Sudan. And that's something I would invite you to look at, uh, uh, to look into. A few years ago, I think 2021, 2022, we were in discussion in an IGAD-led process where they had established an IGAD-led uh, support platform to look at solutions for the forcibly displaced from South Sudan and Sudan. That has stalled. But it had so much potential. And I would say that let's put back those solutions onto the table which embrace the forcibly displaced, but also include refugees. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Madam Ioannina Karugaba. She has, uh, she has painted a very grim reality that at some point, uh, Conflicts consume so many people, not because of the active conflict, but because of inability to access critical life needs, health care, food, and the, the general hopelessness. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam, for very wonderful. So it, uh, it's that time that uh, we want to ask questions so you can... Uh, we have uh, Madam Ayan Nurie. Ayan uh, talked about the opportunities that civil societies are pursuing, and she also recognized some challenges that they have in the process of engagement in mediation in, in Sudan. Uh, Dr. Walter Ochanda has mentioned the issue of EGAD. All right, so you can also shoot a question to Walter. I think, Walter, when you will be answering questions, allow me to chip in that uh, what happened to EGAD's early warning? Because I think uh, if it was functional, we should not be in this stage. So, Walter, I think as you answer questions, you will, you will update us on, uh, because I think IGAD has a very comprehensive uh, early warning system. There's also this early warning unit, Severus, in almost virtually all communities. So, I think, uh, and then finally now, the question of refugees. I think Madam Ioannina has mentioned the kind of issues that they face. It's very critical. So, ladies and gentlemen, may I see your hands up? Uh, one, uh, two. Three. Any other? So the mic should move uh, the, lady, the lady there first. Excuse me, the lady there first. Yes. And after that, then uh, the gentleman, and then we come here. Then we'll go for the next round. So you just shoot your question. Don't make another presentation, please. <laughs> go ahead. Thank you, Professor Junior. My question is for Joanina. Thank you for your presentation. And I want to know how the UNHCR is managing forcible displacement and migration in the context of climate change. We know that Sudan is also experiencing a lot of droughts and lately flooding uh, for long periods. How are you managing that? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, the presenters, for the insightful presentation. And my first question goes to Ayan. Ayan, with your good years of experience in this field, I would really like to know uh, what will you advise our brothers who are and sisters in Sudan, the civil society? From what they are currently doing, is there something that you really want them to do differently? Or is there something that you really want them to engage in and that currently they are not doing? And my second question is to Madame Joannina. Uh, we've seen the response of the host government of uh, Egypt of uh, asking for visas for refugees. I really want to know what are the responses of the host communities of these particular countries where our sisters and brothers of Sudan have fled to us refugees. Thank you. Right, thank you. Then uh, the next. That's it. Yeah, go ahead. 
thank you. My question is also for uh, Ms. Ayan. Uh, I appreciate what you said about uh, inclusion and the dangers of things like tokenism. And I just wondered if uh, you see things, a particular danger in this case in terms of inclusion, where many of the most uh, active and mobilized civil society actors are still in Sudan because either they couldn't get out or they stayed to work and keep civil space open. And the ones that have access to the decision makers and the donors are the ones who are based or are now in Nairobi and Kampala and maybe Addis and are sort of the more established usual suspects. And is there a realistic way to involve the more grassroots actors and not let the, uh, the more established ones crowd out the space? Any other uh, uh, presenters? I want to move you to the high table. There's a high table here. So, Doc, you can come. Ayan, you can come. Madam Joannina, you can uh, sit on the high table for now. Uh, we can have another question so that they can take four. So, give him the mic. Eh? Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, you can just sit there. Ayan, uh, I need you to be in the middle. So, shoot. Thank you, sir. Um, a question to Ayan and uh, civil society. I'm wondering whether there is a regional, how the regional civil society is okay. responding to uh, the civil society in Sudan. Are they getting any support? Is there any organization from the regional states? We've heard about the governments and the UN system and the AU, but are regional organizations in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and the other countries supporting the uh, civil society in Sudan? Okay, a regional approach. So, Madam. Uh, Joannina, I think we start with you. Uh, give, give the first one. The, uh, yeah, Madam Joannina, you can go ahead. Then we come to Ayan. Okay, thank you very much for the, the, the question on, uh, on climate change. Um, and in the Sudan situation, particularly uh, South Sudan is, is going to face floods and for, for several years we've had years and years of floods so that's something that we put into our contingency plans in terms of preparation to respond to those or move people away it does impact on us cost wise because it is it is more expensive to move populations away from the borders during these climatic situations like floods um, so that that is a, a preoccupation of ours and in the bigger picture, we've, we've come up with a climate action strategy and are trying to involve uh, more actors, including trying to access financing from these climate financing uh, entities to see how we can reinforce the work which we do in those uh, countries that are uh, impacted by climate change, but particularly in this situation, the South Sudan uh, response. Um, in terms of what is the response of host communities? I want to say maybe we under-emphasize the importance of host communities. They are the first responders. Oftentimes, those, those are people they probably know. They are the ones who will be there even before we arrive. They are the ones who will re receive a lot of uh, the refugees. Um, they are normally a part of our refugee response plan because the strategy that we employ and what we've been promoting together we eagerd is really one of promoting integration so that we s we reduce parallel systems ideas that refugees belong to camps but a system where we integrate uh, refugees into the national systems uh, of the neighboring countries so host communities absolutely important they are uh, they are the first responders and often uh, often the ones who take the heaviest burden uh, of the response um, I think, yeah, I think those were my two questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ayan? Thank you. And thanks for asking those questions. Um, the advice, I think, I, I will sum it up to common vision. Uh, what we see right now is uh, the three different dis uh, distinct uh, civil society groups in Sudan. Uh, we have the formal regulated civil society organizations, and then we have more uh, the traditional uh, faith-based organizations, and then the revolutionary groups that came up uh, 2018 thereabouts, uh, and some of them before. So th there, is, there is an urgent need uh, and a very important one to have a common vision uh, in a way that um, the ideas and the concerns of the civil society at large uh, represents those of, uh, uh, of the population of Sudan. Uh, the short answer to that, common vision, common objective uh, for them to move in, in the same direction. 
Um, my advice to them, I think also, uh, I don't know if I'm in a position to advise, but uh, hopefully uh, it will be good to see um, many more public consultations, uh, wider and broader um, uh, public consultations um, uh, championed by the civil society organization. They have been doing this for ages. Uh, I think it's just time to uh, um, increase our support uh, to those actors so that they can continue uh, with their efforts. Um, the particular danger with the meaningful inclusion, um, or rather just inclusion, is that um, uh, you will have, especially in, in political processes and mediation processes where mediators um, give the room or platform to civil and civilian uh, actors to come on board into the mediation process, the political uh, parties themselves bring their own civilian uh, and their own CSO groups. Um, there are ways uh, to, do, to go about meaningful inclusion. Uh, you can have a layered approach. Uh, whereby, um, and we have seen this happening in other mediation processes and even in the Khartoum process, uh, where you bring on board civil society organizations in the room, but just as, as observers, but they could also be uh, participants uh, or participating through the political uh, parties. Uh, but I think the most effective way from, from where I stand um, uh, and from a peace building perspective is to have a layered approach if you need, if you're looking for meaningful inclusion. Uh, layered approach in a way that you have those in the room, whether they could be observers or sitting at the table, but you also have them around the room discussing the different issues uh, that, of, that are of major concern to the people, um, whether they're economic issues, social issues, um, political issues, bringing those concerns outside of the room into, um, into the political uh, track one process. Uh, but you, also, you, can, you could also do um, uh, a third level of inclusion, a meaningful inclusion, where you have people um, outside, not just outside of the room, but like within the communities, the entire country, the entire state, having um, public consultations, uh, having advocacy, sensitization, awareness campaigns, uh, bringing those concerns, those needs um, through the civil society groups and coordinating them. Uh, I think in South Sudan, if I can just give an example, and, and Walter was advising that process, one of the ways to include an ambassador sat is there. One of the ways to include the civil society was the mediators actually advising all the groups that were coming, those outside of the room and those in the country, to coordinate themselves and to come up with a mechanism that was representative of everyone. Uh, to have meaningful inclusion, I think one way is to want to recognize that there are all these actors present and they, they come in different uh, layers and they're significant to the process and see how to include all of them uh, into the main uh, political process should there be one. Um, there was a third question, right? Yeah, regional, uh, regional uh, initiatives. Yes. Uh, so um, uh, currently what we have is we see mostly international non-governmental organizations uh, supporting the local national civil society organizations to do these stakeholder uh, consultations, to do these public consultations. Uh, EGAD is also involved, working closely through the humanitarian response uh, unit, working with civil society organizations. There is a, a framework being developed to ensure uh, that um, civil society are engaged through uh, a streamlined uh, approach. Uh, the African Union has also been engaging civil society organizations. Um, I, I think uh, many of the peace building practitioners in the region have been advocating, uh, especially in regards to mobilizing resources for the national and local civil society actors and the civilians. You know, in Sudan, we had civilians. You have civilians like women, not even in the women groups who are taking up those responsibilities. Uh, to respond, uh, to support uh, the victims, uh, to um, record uh, these issues of sexual and gender-based violence, to provide uh, medical uh, response and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, the peace-building practitioners in the region have been trying to support uh, the civilians, the individuals, and the organizations at large. Uh, I think that's how I can sum up uh, the answer. All right, thank you. Uh, Walter, early warning. Thank you. Uh, 
I think you've raised a very difficult question, uh, but I will attempt to, to answer it. Now, the IGAD conflict and early warning uh, response mechanism, in fact, produces a regular report, uh, including uh, events monitoring reports. We have uh, situational uh, monitoring reports, and there is a combined data stream report. Now, these reports uh, cover certain parameters in an economy or in, in, in our member states. Uh, it covers security, covers governance, uh, covers um, uh, social issues, uh, and also covers uh, economic and uh, environmental issues. About five parameters that uh, the events, uh, monitoring, situational, and combined data stream reports uh, cover. Now, the reports are shared with the IGAD Secretariat, but also shared with uh, the AU uh, through the CUs uh, for a more higher level of follow-up. Uh, we also have our CWERUs who are based in member states. And these CWERUs, uh, they also receive this report. Now, the consumption of the report is, I think, what you're asking. Uh, the consumption of these reports is pegged on individual member states. And uh, if I may uh, say for the case of Sudan, these reports, of course, the early warning is sent to the respective CWERU members and uh, the authorities on how they use it to diffuse some of those early warnings is now um, a sovereign uh, matter. It's not uh, eager to, to do that. Uh, this is how I would like to sum up my response. Thank you. Thank you very much. We can have another round. Uh, where's the mic? So uh, I think just stay put until I authorize your removal. Eh? <laughs> yeah, give uh, Ambassador here. Uh, any other? This side, you're very quiet. Eh? I will nominate somebody. Okay. Yeah, so I think give. Yeah, where's the mic? Yeah, pass one, then pass the other one to the um, gentleman there. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Ambassador. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, three quick, uh, quick uh, questions. I really appreciate the presentations. Uh, Ayan, thank you very much. Uh, how can we, uh, in the civil society of Sudan, better uh, interact uh, with, uh, with EGAD MSU? Uh, how, what do you advise us to do? Uh, and I would ask uh, a similar question to Mr. Ochada. Uh, with a slightly different, uh, you know, um, emphasis. How can we uh, better um, organize uh, our interaction with both EGAD and the, and the AU and get required information from them as to their plans and intentions? Uh, and I'm asking this because we have a lot of difficulty to get information. Uh, we have been asking for plans, intentions, uh, how can we help, uh, what kind of interaction, cooperation, collaboration can we have. We have not received answers thus, thus far. So I, I, I would like. Concerning uh, C1, um, uh, well, uh, my question to Mr. Ochada is, uh, uh, what are the mechanisms for collection of data? I'm asking this because I have personally been personally involved in the early uh, years of C1. By the way, for the younger generation, um, I don't think that you are one of them. <laughs> uh, C1 was initiated here in Nairobi uh, at the Intercontinental Hotel uh, and led by the late uh, Ambassador Kiplagat. Uh, that's uh, how the story started, and then it developed you know, to something. So, uh, we were, uh, one of the issues, that our concerns about collection of data uh, was that there was resistance from governments uh, and security. Uh, you know, operators in certain countries as to getting to real information. Uh, and uh, we were advocating at a certain time uh, using uh, civil society uh, and uh, communities, uh, basic communities, in order to help in the collection uh, of data. Uh, my, my, my question to uh, 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 Madame Ajwani, now I am a former colleague of UNESCO, uh, and I appreciate uh, UNHCR. Uh, we have been uh, working with UNCFR for education of refugees uh, in this area, and I was leading a program some 20 years ago, funded by UNCR and the EU. Uh, so my question is, uh, there are many, many, of course, all the areas are crucial and critical. But from one point of view, uh, a UNESCO man, uh, education, uh, you mentioned education as one of the priorities. Uh, what is happening? Because uh, some of our colleagues, we have an organization that's called the uh, Sudan Collective Voice, 
which is working on the issue of education. And they're organizing themselves to get support and resources and, and learning what's going on uh, within Sudan and around Sudan. So if you can just say a few words about uh, education and how we can work with you on that. Thank you very much. Any other? Yes, yes. Um, thank you very much. My question is also for, for Walter. I don't know if it's a question or a comment, um, but um, the conflict early warning mechanism for EGAD was, was the pioneer early warning mechanism, and it has set up to some extent and influenced how early warning looks across the continent. But over the journey, I think it's also become apparent that um, there are two main issues that, that afflict early warning mechanisms. The first is how and according to whose authority information is shared, right? Because most of it is not based on a standard operating procedure. And there's a lot of political decision making that goes into the process of sharing the report with member states, with even the executive secretary, with the African Union level. So. Um, what is the, the initiative, or is there an initiative to resolve that? And the second is, when do we now start as EGAD member states, as well as the conflict early warning, agitating for early response, an early response that's based on the agency of EGAD um, as, as an organization itself? When do we stop relying on member states to have a rapid response or any response to their own issues? Thank you. Yeah, I think then you can uh, have those as we wrap up. Any other question, I think at uh, tea time, it can still continue. So I'll start from Walter now going uh, downwards. Walter. Thank you. Um, let me start with uh, the first question by Ambassador, which is uh, how can we better organize our interactions with IGAD and AU to have access to information uh, and other uh, uh, engagements. Maybe let me use the case of uh, South Sudan to try to respond to uh, Ambassador. Le let me use the case of South Sudan to try to respond to this question. During the South Sudan peace process, initially, uh, as some of you may be aware, the process was mainly the way you see the Jeddah and between the principles. I'm referring to the 2014 process. It was I.O. and uh, the government on the table. However, the special envoys at that time, there were three uh, ambassadors, the late Seyou Mesfin, General El Dabi, and Lazarus Simbeyu. A decision was made that the process needed to be expanded to include the civil society. And what happened uh, was to map out. We had a workshop. Uh, to map out all the civil society representatives. The objective was, one, to, so that they have a common position on the peace process and issues to do with the representation, etc., etc. I believe uh, this similar approach uh, can still assist uh, in resolving uh, or responding to your question. The first undertaking would be to map out uh, the civil society uh, because as people have reported, right now the civil society are fragmented. Some are in-country, some are out of, uh, in the region, others are global. And therefore there should be a deliberate effort to map all these civil society members and then convene, convene a meeting of the civil society representatives so that they come up with a common position on the, their involvement or their participation in the Sudanese uh, peace process. And of course, subsequently, uh, there will be contact persons. And through those contact persons, or the identified, the civil society will identify their representatives to participate in the process. And through those leaders, then communication channels will be established. And of course, uh, I think it will address that matter. And it has happened in the South Sudan peace process. I'm not trying to say it's a copy and paste, but uh, I think this practice can also assist in resolving uh, this matter. And then there was a question on um, the data collection mechanism. Uh, the C1, of course, you know, um, sources of data need to be protected. But I'll try to describe the ones that are available. We have the CWERUs, which is the conflict uh, response units that are at, of course, member state level. They also provide information. But C1 is also using civil society organizations. They, they have structures on how to engage them. 
and also the community. They provide uh, information that then trickles through to uh, the C1 for analysis and, uh, of course, uh, reporting. So um, on, on the issue of resistance uh, from government, I think that was, at that time, uh, as, as I speak now, I think C1 has not had that challenge uh, in terms of accessing data from member states at the moment. Maybe if the resistance is on the use of the report, as I stated earlier, the reports are shared with the Secretariat, but also through the AU, CUs, but also with our structures at the member state level. Uh, and then let me tie that with the question uh, asked by uh, uh, the lady over there about uh, how do we stop, uh, I think she said, relying on member states to respond. I think the, the primary responsibility for peace and security in any member state is the duty of the state, correct? And uh, of course, based on other international parameters. However, uh, IGAD has not stopped uh, using this information. The Office of the Executive Secretary engages regularly um, with the member states on how these reports are used. First of all, if you look at uh, on Sudan, maybe let me describe how um, IGAD became part of the, the trilateral mechanism. It's through these reports that were being issued by the, uh, the, 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 the conflict analyst at, at C1, and also, um, of course, other team members, the IGAD secretariat was able to travel to uh, Khartoum and met with the, the principals there. Uh, and then there were deliberations on how IGAD can play a role in the trilateral mechanism. I mean, in, 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 in the, the peace process in Sudan. And subsequently, the executive secretary uh, delegated the IGAD special envoy for South Sudan to also support Sudan. You can see how this uh, uh, response uh, initiative was also undertaken by IGAD initiative, not necessarily from the member state level. But of course, um, as I stated, the primary duty for peace and security in a country relies with the, the sovereign, which is the member state. And, uh, but uh, IGAD, in sharing it with AU, is also an initiative to also scale up, I mean, flag the issue at the continental level, but also with other uh, stakeholders to, to ensure that there is a collective effort in solving uh, some of uh, the issues that are arising from the early warning systems uh, reports. Uh, I think I've responded to all my questions. Thank you. Yeah, Jan. I think um, Walter has to an extent answered my question as well on how we can better um, ambassador's question on how can we better interact with the uh, EGAD but more so the mediation support unit. Um, given the current, uh, I mean given uh, or considering what's going on in Sudan now, uh, Ambassador, I don't think I will be in a position to give a definite answer but <laughs> in terms of what is going on especially with the civil society organizations but I think um, Looking at the political process and looking at mediation, um, the mediation support unit is in a position to support civil society organizations should there be a process uh, to build their capacity and strengthen their capacity for them to have a better understanding of what mediation entails, especially effective mediation. And maybe that's an entry point for civil society organizations and also for eager to support um, civil society organizations to bring them uh, up to par with you know, uh, the current dynamics, what is happening, what mediation entails, how do they uh, you know, consolidate their position, their interests and their needs, uh, and how do they carry themselves when it comes to um, uh, participating uh, in the political uh, process. Uh, that is one, and uh, as we speak, the mediation support unit is developing a framework for engaging uh, civil society organizations uh, in conflict prevention, conflict resolution, dialogue facilitation, and mediation. So one of the, I think, the next um, agenda item will be to map out or identify key um, civil society actors in all the seven, eight countries uh, and bring them together to create a forum 
And hopefully that forum going forward is going to be a representative or a representation, or it's going to be um, uh, speaking on, on all regional issues um, in regards to peace and security, social, economic, uh, but any of those issues that have uh, impact uh, or, or in a way affect the state of peace and security in the region. Um, yeah, I think I, I think okay. I'll sum up like yeah, uh, capacity are, strengthening, yeah. more and more advocacy and engaging. Uh, and, yeah. All right. Uh, you want to add something? Yeah, Walter? Can I just supplement yeah, yeah, a please. case study? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, it's a very important question. And again, just to supplement uh, what uh, my colleague has just uh, submitted, the issue of capacity is very important. Mm -hmm. If uh, I may just, uh, for information purposes, give you how the 35% provision in the RACS, in the revitalized agreement on the resolution of the conflict in South Sudan came about. I think you remember we had that meeting in Djibouti, yeah? We brought all uh, the South Sudanese uh, women and the civil society representatives in Djibouti. And arising from that uh, capacity building, and she was there, and MSU provided that technical support in terms of training them on some of the issues that they'll be discussing uh, during the, the, the mediation. And uh, they came up with what we call the Djibouti Joint Plan of Action. That then empowered them to actively participate in the South Sudanese peace process and even demanded for this 35%, which was then became a reality and it is part of the RACS, as many of you know. So I think there is practice and, uh, in, 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 in doing this. And I believe if IGAD is working closely with the AU and other stakeholders in uh, uh, facilitating the Sudanese peace process. Uh, maybe just to say one more thing, which is not part of this. Uh, sorry, uh, oh, one more minute. Right. Igad was engaged, in fact, on the issue of South, I mean, Sudanese uh, um, uh, civil society participation in the process. And I can tell you the current uh, joint uh, framework that the AU is now facilitating initially started from uh, the Igad. And I was part of the, the team that worked on how this should, we mapped out some steps, which I described in my response, on how the, the civil society will be brought on board in, in terms of the peace process. So I think um, IGAD has the capacity and the, the practice is there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Madam Jerry? Uh, sorry, but oh. uh, can we uh, know a little bit about this uh, joint uh, framework? Because, uh, well, if you have been working on it, we, we, we have been asking for it, but uh, we have not been... Yeah, Walter, briefly. Yes. I've been out of the meeting. Maybe. Yes, or I think uh, out of the meeting. Ambassador, that, that's very good. Yeah, uh, Madam Joannina. Okay, uh, just a, a little bit about uh, education. One, I will say that, um, uh, first of all, Sudan was a, a, a very generous country to refugees. If I recall Khartoum University, there were discussions with Khartoum University where they gave, it was either scholarships to allow refugees to attend university, um, or they would pay the same as nationals, or they would come for free. That can be reciprocated and should be reciprocated in receiving countries. And there is a framework which exists, the Djibouti Declaration, which was, uh, uh, I mean, crafted and designed by IGAD for these IGAD countries. How do we share those good practices which exist, which are about inclusion of refugees into national education systems with other regions? Because now we have IGAD, which will only cover South Sudan and Ethiopia, while we have Central African Republic, Chad in another wreck and Egypt in another region. So those are some of the things I would say. Um, we also have your standard emergency education responses where we even call on the refugees themselves who are teachers. Yesterday somebody said Sudanese are among the highly, most highly skilled population. We call on refugees among them are you teachers? Please come forward. Let's start emergency education on ground. So those are things that we do. But I would also say that in the, the, the context of the localization agenda, the uh, grand bargain, we are looking for national partners. We are also looking for refugee-led 
organizations in countries of asylum, such if refugees come together, we should be working more with them and trying to channel funding to local organizations than being highly dependent. And I think education is one of those places where we can continue to work with international organizations, but also build and provide resources for, for, for local organizations to engage in upscaling education, because capacity in ref re refugee hosting countries is also limited. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, uh, for the responses. So I think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of the session now. I want to request that we clap for the presenters. No, 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 I've not finished. <laughs> I've not finished. Uh, the first one goes to Ayan Nurie. A very heavy clap. <laughs> excellent, excellent. The, the other one goes to Dr. Walter Chanda. The other one goes to Madam Joannina Karugaba. And uh, the final one, which is very strong, myself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think you can sit back. Uh, thank you very much, uh, colleagues, for wonderful discussion. I think we can still share as uh, we go for tea and even um, you, the final meal, because this is part of our networking. So allow me uh, to thank you for not bringing crisis to my moderation. <laughs> you are resolving it instead. So let me hand over power peacefully back to Dr. Kanenje. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, let's give him a final round of applause. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, uh, this tea time, and uh, I'm informed that tea is going to be served right outside today because our numbers are a little bit relatively smaller than yesterday, so we don't have to go all the way down there. So uh, feel free, just uh, you can step out and grab some coffee or tea or juice if it's available. But in case uh, there is not enough space, I guess we're going to have to talk to the hotel, but I think uh, we can fit uh, these uh, sufficient numbers. So, Karibu, uh, please, let's go have something and let's come back on time. We have about 20 minutes for tea and we should be back. So, look at your clock. Thank you. Asante.